For the best viewing and audio experience, we recommend that you use Chrome as your browser during the event and minimize the number of open windows you may have. <clears throat> Welcome to today's webinar. We know your time is valuable and we appreciate you joining us. Our session will begin shortly, but let's cover a few housekeeping items before we dive into RCV in 2021. Due to the number of attendees, we have muted participants to reduce audio interference. For better viewing, you may expand or minimize your menu control panel by clicking on the orange tab located on the left edge of the panel. If you have technical issues, please use the chat feature located at the bottom of your control panel to send us a message and we'll try to assist you. Attendees may also submit questions or comments using the chat feature. Staff will answer any questions we are unable to address during the live session through follow-up correspondence. A recording of this event and associated materials will be placed on the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center website as soon as possible. For those of you not familiar with the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center, we provide a compilation of best practices and firsthand experiences from jurisdictions that have used this method of voting with a focus on election administration and implementation. Our website, rcvresources.org, and other content have been developed as educational tools for election administrators, policymakers, voters, candidates, and others. Excuse me. Today's presenters are yours truly, Rosemary Blizzard, Chris Hughes, Ryan Kirby, and Kelly Seacrest. I'm the current business manager for the RCVRC. Before coming on board, I spent a combined 16 years as a local and state level election administrator. Chris Hughes is our policy director and staff attorney. He also co-produces our podcast, RCV Clips, and is certified to practice law in New York. Ryan Kirby, one of our two newest team members, <clears throat> joins us from Maryland, where he was most recently the chief of staff for State Senator Cheryl Kagan. Last but certainly not least is Kelly Seacrest. Kelly is the development director for the organization and has done an excellent job promoting our work across the country. Let's get started. And spoiler alert, you're gonna to have to listen to me just a little bit longer as I am tasked with covering New York City and its role in a, <clears throat> its first foray into ranked choice voting in 2021. So a little history about New York City and ranked choice voting. RCV was adopted in 2019 with the law going into effect January 1, 2021. This law covered uh, the use of RCV for city primaries and special elections. Some of the offices included were mayor, comptroller, public advocate, borough president, and city council. It uses the single winner method and the equipment it used in polling places is the ESNS DS200 and Automark. And if you're not familiar with those that piece of equipment, the DS200 is the tabulator where the ballots are inserted when voters are finished with them. And the auto mark is used as the ADA compliant equipment and it is a ballot marking device. And once the auto mark is used and the ballot has been marked, it is put into the DS200 like all other ballots. So let's talk a little bit, just a timeline about the 2021 uses. Uh, the first was February 2nd, 2021, which was a vacancy election for District 24 in, in Queens. February 23rd, there was another vacancy election for uh, District 31. In March, there were two uh, vacancies for Council District 11 and 15 in the Bronx. And then, of course, when one we'll spend a little more time on was the June 26th. 22nd, 2021, first citywide use for party primaries for mayor and other city offices. So briefly, as I said just a few seconds ago, February and March elections were individual vacancies for various council districts. So these were quite small, both in turnout and then, of course, not citywide. RC tab, or better known as the Ranked Choice Voting Universal Tabulator, had not been approved for use by the New York State Board of Elections at this time, so results were hand counted. Canvas reports for these races can be found at the New York City Board of Elections page, uh, more specifically their election results summary. And don't worry about capturing that link, we will make that available in our materials. So let's move on to June 22nd, 2021. New York City used it for the 2021 primaries and special elections for various offices and through citywide and district races. 
This was the city's first citywide use of ranked choice voting and the largest citywide RCV elections in U.S. history thus far. Highest turnout in over 32 years with 941,000 voters coming out to vote. The very, uh, our very own RC tab was used to tabulate the round by round counting where necessary and performed beautifully. So just a very quick um, run through of kind of what happened. We're going to use the mayor's race as the one we're going to talk about since it, it did garner the most attention, I think. Um, on the Republican side of things, the candidate that um, ultimately ended up winning the nomination won in the first round. So just even with ballots being given voters the opportunity to rank their choices, sometimes people win in the first round. And in this case, uh, Curtis Lee won with 67.9% of the vote. It's a slightly different story on the Democratic side of things where there were far more candidates. And ultimately, it took eight rounds of counting for Eric Adams to emerge the ultimate winner or nominee for the Democratic Party. And just a quick to finish out what happened in November, which was not an RCV election. There were 10 candidates and Eric Adams won with 66.14% of the vote to become New York's next mayor. Because of the fact that this was one of the largest citywide uses of ranked choice voting in U.S. history, it garnered quite a bit of attention. Um, so there was quite a bit of uh, lead up to the election, but also after the election, you know, what did people think about it? And as you can see here, 83 percent of the voters ranked two or more of their candidates. Ninety five percent said it was simple. Seventy seven percent want to keep using it. And this is in keeping with the exit poll information that we've gathered from other smaller jurisdictions. So it's a good the fact that we've got a, a much bigger um, selection of information. It's also nice to see that that those numbers actually still those percentages, excuse me, still maintain that that level. And what's next? At this point in time, there are no obvious challenges to what is currently in place. Uh, of course, we are all going to be fo focused on the 2022 midterms. And we'll see if that, that shakes anything out from there. The next expected use of RCV will be 2023 elections. And the redistricting at that point will trigger a wider use in terms of the number of contests that will be on the, ba on the ballot and subject to ranked choice voting. So with that, I'm going to pass things over to Chris Hughes, who's going to give a bit more information about the use of ranked choice voting in Utah. Thanks, Rosemary. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Chris Hughes. I'm the policy director at the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center. Before I get started, I want to say I see some debate happening in the chat. Um, we're not hosting a debate on the merits of ranked choice voting. We're just providing a basic uh overview survey of, of the ranked choice voting elections that happened this year. If people continue to uh, you know, hold this a relevant debate in the comment, we will start removing people. So please, if you want to, um, if you want to have these debates, do so in a different forum, not here. Um, anyway, getting back to, to my part of the presentation, I'm just going to quickly overview um, what's happening in Utah this year in ranked choice voting. Um, so Utah has a, a municipal pilot project that they adopted in 2018. Um, they passed a law in March of 2018, HB 35, that permits any city in the state of Utah to adopt ranked choice voting for um, their mayor and city council elections. The pilot project is currently scheduled to end in January 2026, so uh, in just over four years. Uh, in this fall, they held their second cycle of ranked choice voting elections under uh, under that pilot project law. The first cycle was held in 2019. Two cities, Payson and Vineyard, Utah, uh, held ranked choice voting elections then. And this year, it was uh, 20 cities, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Uh, before I move on to my next slide, I wanted to say, because this is a pilot project, there's been a lot of tinkering and learning uh, with, about how ranked choice voting is working in Utah. Uh, so there's been a few bills passed since the initial adoption of the pilot project. Um, 
that have sort of updated, revised, and improved the uh, the initial law, the, the sort of underlying ranked choice voting law in Utah. The most recent bill that passed was HB 75, which passed in March of this year. And that, uh, that bill was passed to ease the adoption and implementation of ranked choice voting. Um, it allowed a city uh, which wanted to use ranked choice voting to contract with any county in the state to run their elections. Uh, that's relevant because counties in the state of Utah run elections for cities within their borders, but some counties may not have the equipment necessary to run ranked choice voting elections or may not have the bandwidth to run those elections. So cities could contract instead with another county that had the equipment, had everything lined up to run ranked choice voting elections on their behalf. And there actually was one city that took advantage of that this year, which I'll talk about in a second. So like I said in my last slide, 23 cities have now adopted ranked choice voting in the state of Utah. They're scattered across five counties. And you see, excuse me, the map on this slide um, shows pins for every single city that has adopted ranked choice voting. Most of them are sort of in that core area just southeast of the Great Salt Lake. Um, but you've also got a few places in the northern part of the state and Moab, Utah, which is way out uh, in the southeast corner. Um, of the 23 cities that have adopted ranked choice voting, 20 uh, are using ranked choice voting or used ranked choice voting this fall, sorry. Uh, that means those 20 cities, at least one of their ranked choice voting contests had three or more candidates running. Uh, there were 36 total contests in these cities. 24 of them were single winner. So elections for mayor or elections for uh, single member districts to city council. Uh, and then another 12 uh, block preferential voting. Block preferential voting is the form of multi-winner or the, the multi-winner type of, of ranked choice voting used in Utah. It's a particular to Utah. Um, and it's, I'm not going to go into the details of it now, but uh, there are other forms of multi-winner ranked choice voting that are generally recommended above it. But this is the, the type that's used in Utah in specific. 48 total seats were filled in these 36 contests, 24 in the single winner and two apiece in all 12 of those block preferential voting elections. So just a quick survey of these implementations. Um, 19 of the 20 cities were using ranked choice voting for the first time. Uh, nine of them were in Salt Lake County, five were in Utah County. Those are the two largest counties by population in the state of Utah. Um, and then another five in smaller, more rural counties, three in Cache County, one in Wasatch County, and one in Grand County. The city and Grand County, uh, Moab, Utah, um, actually had their election conducted by Utah County. They took advantage of that law that I mentioned earlier that allowed the city to contract with a different county, in this case, Utah County, to run their ranked choice voting election. So that law helped Moab adopt ranked choice voting and, and use it this fall. Then there was also one repeat implementation. Uh, Vineyard, Utah, used ranked choice voting for the second time this fall. Pace and Vineyard, which also used ranked choice voting in 2019, uh, only had one or two candidates in each of its contests this fall, so they did not use ranked choice. Uh, on this slide, you can also see a sample ballot from Vineyard from their ranked choice voting elections. Uh, so that's generally what ballots look like in a lot of cities in Utah, because this was the style of ballot used in Cache County and then, uh, or sorry, in Utah County, Cache County, Wasatch, and for Moab. And a little bit more about uh, just some of the basics of ranked choice voting administration in Utah. Um, on ballots, every ballot in Utah was a grid style ballot. So the type of ballot you see on this slide or on the previous slide, uh, where candidate names are listed once, columns for each ranking, voters get to rank candidates in order of preference. Um, there's a different style of ballot, a column style ballot that is used in other jurisdictions, but Utah only used grid style ballots. Every ballot had some basic written instructions about how to fill the ballot out and some, uh, the ballot on this slide is from Salt Lake County, from Salt Lake City in particular. They also included some visual instructions. Um, so that's, that's some of the basics on the ballot design, a bit more information about the voting systems. Um, so we are, as, as Rosemary mentioned, RC tab, the universal RCV tabulator, was used in New York City, and it was also, we had the most recent version of it certified for use in Utah before their elections this fall. 
uh, and 11 of the 20 cities in Utah used RCTAB for their elections. Um, those were the 11 cities that used ESNS, election systems and software equipment to capture their ranked choice voting ballots. Um, and then another nine cities used Dominion voting systems equipment. And there's a bit more information about those counties on the next slide. So as I mentioned, the ESNS plus RCTAB were used in across three counties, Cache County, Utah, and Wasatch. Utah County, of course, also includes Moab, which is technically included in Grand County. Um, that equipment is a mix of DS200s, which was also used in New York, DS450s and DS850s, and the Express Vote Accessible uh, Voting System. And then Dominion Voting Systems is used in Salt Lake County, and that was uh, the Dominion Central Count and their accessible equipment. Um, in all 20 cities that used ranked choice voting, um, every city used RCVIS, which was developed by Armin Samiai, who's a volunteer out of Pennsylvania, um, who has developed the RCVIS website, rcviz.com, to display ranked choice voting results. It's compatible now with RCTAB data, as well as with uh, data coming out of Dominion, which Armin got the chance to work on uh, by working with Salt Lake County, contracting with them to make it compatible with Dominion's ranked choice voting ballot data, or ranked choice voting results data, I should say. And the screenshot on this slide is of the Lehigh City Council race on RCVIS. Um, I'm going to move pretty quick through these next few slides because I'm already at eight minutes uh, and we have a lot of slides to get through. But one thing I want to touch on, and this is an interesting thing that also uh, came up in Portland this fall, is there were two or there will have been two recounts in Utah ranked choice voting elections this fall. The ranked choice voting law in Utah has very clear conditions for when um, for when a recount must be conducted in a ranked choice voting contest. There's a very specific formula for determining when the margin is narrow enough that you must conduct some kind of recount of your ranked choice voting election. Um, and there are two cities that have recounted or will recount their elections uh, in Utah this fall. Sandy City uh, recounted their mayoral election. It was one of the higher profile races. They had, I think it was eight, maybe nine candidates running. It was a very competitive race to, to fill an open seat mayor. And they recounted that contest two weeks ago. And then Moab um, also has a recount that's scheduled for next Wednesday that they'll be conducting because one of their uh, one of their city their their city council race had a couple really tight margins that fell within that recount uh, threshold. Uh, so some quick numbers on Utah. I covered a couple of these earlier, but there were 36 contests held in Utah this fall. 36 rank choice contests. 24 were single winner. 12 were block preferential voting. 48 seats were filled uh, in those rank choice voting contests. 108,943 total votes were cast in the state of Utah in these ranked choice voting contests this fall, and more than 100 candidates ran across these 36 contests in Utah. Um, Utah RCV also held an exit poll of uh, in uh, in these ranked choice voting contests, and and also got some responses from non-ranked choice uh, jurisdictions to learn about what their experience voting was. Uh, these are some of the top lines from the ranked choice voting cities. Coming out of the polls, 81% of voters said ranked choice voting is easy. 90% said the ballot instructions were clear. Um, and then there's these interesting stats that I'm happy to talk a bit more about in the Q&A. We'll have to be pretty brief right now. But 64% were satisfied with RCV. Even though 81% of voters said RCV was easy, that dropped 17 points and people, 64% said they were satisfied with ranked choice voting and 62% liked voting the ranked choice voting ballot. So there's, um, I think there's some analysis to be done here, some thinking to be done here about what the disconnect is um, and it, happy to talk about that in the Q&A. And of course, 62 and 64%, those are still pretty high numbers. That's more than a majority. It's, I mean, it's more votes than you need to pass a bill in the Senate. So still seems pretty good. <sighs> Uh, last thing, there's a couple things just to keep an eye on in Utah. There are discussions about making some more updates to the pilot project law to um, clarifying some of the recount procedures to um, updating some of the ballot error handling rules that uh, got discussed earlier in the election cycle and possibly adding more options for multi-winner ranked choice voting contests in the state. 
Uh, there's also the potential, you know, there's still four more years on the pilot project. More cities could adopt it under the terms of this law. And I, there's, I can't say there's any specific plans for this, but, you know, there's the potential down the line, I wouldn't say next year, but down the line for an expansion beyond municipal elections to higher levels of office in the state of Utah. Um, so with that, I will pass it off to Ryan. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Chris, for that. Um, so I will start off. Uh, we're going to do some, handle some local ranked choice voting implementations and expansions focused on Minnesota, New Mexico, and Portland, Maine. And then I'll also focus on some other local expansions across the country. Uh, in Minnesota, um, there are now five cities that use ranked choice voting. Minneapolis was the first to adopt ranked choice voting in 2009. And the organization Ranked Choice Voting Bloomington noted that more than 545,000 RCV ballots have been cast in Minnesota since then. Ranked Choice Voting is also used in St. Paul and St. Louis Park. Um, St. Paul adopted in 2011 and St. Louis Park in 2019. Voters in Bloomington and Minnetonka adopted Ranked Choice Voting measures in 2020 and successfully used those uh, that election style in 2021. Uh, you can see the election results on the screen, um, but both cities were fortunate to see both a candidate receive a majority with 50% of the votes in the first round, and there were races that took multiple rounds to get a majority. So they got a kind of a flavor from both of them. Um, it was noted that Bloomington could be improved by helping them move away from hand counting results. Unfortunately, the Minnesota Secretary of State's office has not approved the Resource Center's free universal tabulator for use. However, Minneapolis did test the universal tabulator this year alongside their normal counting procedures. Um, and Minnetonka had, Minnetonka had greater success with timely results because they used the Minneapolis method, um, which uses computer spreadsheets to support their manual process. And in New Mexico, um, Santa Fe and Las Cruces both held ranked choice voting elections. In Santa Fe, RCV was originally adopted by voters in 2008, but there was some wiggle room in the original language um, that required it to be used in 2010 or as soon as voting equipment and software were approved. There was ranked choice voting capable voting equipment approved in 2017 and the city tried to delay the first RCV election until 2020. However, a district court judge ordered ranked choice voting implementation for the 2018 election and the city was able to implement it within just three months. In 2018, they had a five candidate mayor race uh, where Alan Weber won in the fourth round. And there were two of the four city council districts had three candidates, so they used ranked choice voting. Um, and then the city opted in to the local election act of 2018, and they're no longer responsible for running the election. The Santa Fe County now runs their elections. In 2021, their elections included three candidates for mayor, where Mayor Weber won re-election in the first round. And then districts one through four were up for election, but only district one had more than two candidates, where Lindell won with 61% in the first round. In Las Cruces, um, after unanimous vote by the Las Cruces City Council in 2018, voters participated in their first RCV election in, 20, in November 2019. Um, if RCV had not been in place, the 10 candidate mayoral race would have triggered a runoff election. And in 2021, there were two city council races using RCV. Um, the districts three and five used RCV and district three was determined in the first round. District five was determined in the fifth round. District six, only had two candidates, so they didn't need our rank choice voting. Um, there were some concerns noted in the that about lower turnout. Um, there was 11.2% in 2021 compared to 16.5% in 2019. Um, the city clerk's office has stated that they were working to educate people about the importance of local elections. elections. And I also want to note on the slide that there's some polling that FairVote did uh, in 2018. And I want to note that more than 84% of respondents said that the ballot was not confusing at all or not too confusing. So it seemed like people were able to understand ranked choice voting. In Portland, Maine, uh, in 2010, the city voted to elect rather than appoint the mayor using ranked choice voting, and it was successfully implemented in 2011. On March 3rd, 2020, voters approved an expansion of ranked choice voting to the city council and school board members. And during the 2021 election, Portland had the first known ranked choice voting tie. On election night, both uh, Rodriguez and Mazur were tied with 8,529 votes, and the city selected Mazur out of a bowl to break the tie, and Rodriguez requested a recount. Um, after the recount, Rod Rodriguez won by 26 votes. Uh, 
And I just want to reiterate that recounts are just part of the normal process to confirm the results. Um, it was noted that there were 45, there were uh, missing ballots. The city's clerk's office launched their own investigation to figure out why the hand recount number differed from the machine count. And they ended up finding the 45 auxiliary ballots uh, that were write-ins or could not be read by the machines. Uh, they had been entered into the machines manually, but they were not included in the hand recount and they did not change the final result. So looking at some of the recent uh, RCV ballot measures that were enacted across the country, um, we'll start with Burlington, Vermont. In 2005, voters authorized ranked choice voting for the mayoral elections, and it was used in 2006 and 2009 before it was repealed in 2010, just narrowly. In 2020, the city council approved ranked choice voting for all local elections, but it was vetoed by the mayor. And a narrower version, which only focused on city council seats, was approved for voters to consider. And the ballot measure passed, um, but it is pending uh, 20, pending state legislative approval. In Austin, Texas, uh, Austinites for Progressive Reform were able to get ranked choice voting as a ballot initiative to uh, elect their local officials using ranked choice voting. And it passed in May of this year, and they became the first city to authorize ranked choice voting. However, there's a potential hiccup with state law. Currently, if no candidate gets a majority in a municipal election, the top two candidates go into a runoff election. In 2001, the city requested uh, an opinion from the Secretary of State's office. And Henry Cooler, then Secretary of State, argued that the def majority does not include preferential votes and implementation is delayed until state law uses a broader definition of a majority winner. In Westbrook, Maine, in August 2021, the City Council voted unanimously to put our RC referendum on the ballot and they became the second city in the state with the municipal RCV system. Portland is the other and ranked choice voting will be used for all city council, mayoral, and school committee races. Uh, in Broomfield, Colorado, um, the city council voted unanimously in July to include ranked choice voting authoriz authorization on the ballot, and it passed in November of this year. Uh, Broomfield joins Boulder, Basalt, Carbondale, and Telluride as cities that use ranked choice voting in Colorado. However, Broomfield is the first city in the state to elect all local officials with ranked choice voting, and their first RCV election will be held in 2023. And then with Ann Arbor, Mich Michigan, um, they actually used RCV in the 1975 mayoral election. Voters elected Albert Wheeler, the city's first and only black mayor, and then the city decided not to use ranked choice voting again until 2021. Um, in August of this year, the Ann Arbor City Council voted to put ranked choice voting on the ballot, which it passed uh, overwhelmingly in November of this year. And they'll be using ranked choice voting in 2023 for the first time since 1975. And with that, I will turn it over to Kelly Seacrest. Kelly, you may need to unmute and turn your camera on. Thanks for reminding me of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's got to uh, happen at least on one. Got to have at least, at least one. one. Uh, thank you so much for being here, guys. And thanks for um, bearing with me for a minute while I turn my camera back on. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about proportional representation, um, also known as single transferable vote. Um, you know, we use that for many reasons, voting rights issues, better representation, um, the potential to eliminate gerrymandering. Um, so we're going to talk about some communities that have implemented this either recently or in the past and are continuing to do so today. So let's start with East Point, Michigan. Um, in 2017, the Department of Justice filed a um, Voting Rights Act lawsuit against the city. Um, they had a history of, um, you know, not having fair representation, even though the community had changed um, 
its makeup quite a bit, and there was a large black population there. There was not a lot of representation in the city government. Um, also, along with some other issues that they'd had um, with racism across the um, schools and um, policing and all kinds of things, but it, it really all was the perfect storm. And um, once they brought the lawsuit, the recommendation was made to use um, proportional representation in STV or STV as a remedy for their city council elections to try to get some better representation. Um, in 2019, it was first implemented. Um, RCVRC worked with them pretty closely. They used our um, RC tab tabulation software. Um, you'll see that come up several times already and um, through the end of the presentation. It is free and open source um, and, and several jurisdictions do use that to um, run their tabulation. Uh, the city council had the option to potentially continue using STV. Um, they were um, would have put a ballot initiative on for the um, 2021 election to continue to do proportional representation, but they declined to do so. Um, and in 2021, this will likely be the last time it's used. Um, because the court order has, has expired and they would need an additional court order to do so. So the 2021 City Council race, um, they have staggered elections and um, they elected two council members this year. Uh, they had six candidates. Uh, two of them were incumbents. Um, one was a former council member who actually um, what had served in 2017, 2018 around then and uh, lost in a special election when um, the current mayor vacated her seat uh, last year. And then there were three new candidates on the ballot as well. Um, the county clerk reported that it was 14.2% turnout in East Point, um, fairly low, um, seems to be um, you know, common across the U.S. in municipal election years especially. Um, they used ESNS with RC tab for tabulation of the round by round count. So here you can see the visualization of the winners. Um, Cardi DeMonco Jr. won in round one, so he immediately um, met the quota in round one, and then it went to round five to elect Rob Baker. Um, Cardi uh, DeMonco was a um, incumbent, and Rob Baker was the, the individual who um, had served on the council previously. Um, there's also an interactive, this is just the printable version of um, this, and we talked a little bit about RC Viz before. Um, don't worry about copying down all these web addresses we have throughout the presentation. We're going to make sure you have access to those with the webinar materials. But if you want to take a look, um, there is an RC Viz interactive, sort of a movie style, um, where you can watch the rounds go by um, and the, the votes move from um, place to place. So enjoy, uh, hopefully you'll get a chance to take a look at that. All right, Cambridge, Massachusetts. So Cambridge is interesting because they've been using proportional representation for a long time. Um, they're governed under something called Plan E. Um, it's a nine member city council and a six member school committee. Um, both are elected with proportional representation or STV. Um, in 1941, Plan E passed in a referendum and was first implemented in 1942. So they've been using it, you know, going on 80 some 80 years here. So um, they're very familiar with how that works and um, works well for their city. Um, several referenda have, have happened over the years, particularly in the 50s and 60s, um, to, to get rid of PR, but it's actually stayed in place by the will of the voters every time. So they elect um, the council and the committee for two year terms, no stagger. So everyone gets has to run for reelection every two years. Um, they use the tabulation they use is under the Cambridge rules or the Cincinnati method. And um, we can provide you some more information about those um, in the webinar materials if you're interested. And they use the Droop method quota. Um, their voting equipment is Dominion Democracy Suite. And they use the Choice Plus Pro tabulation um, to do the round by round count. Um, and again, you know, we could I could not find uh, exact numbers for their voter turnout, but the Harvard Crimson Online News reported that the turnout was low for 2021. So let's take a look at the city council. Um, this is the results from their official results page. There were 19 candidates um, for nine positions, uh, plus some write ins. Um, nine were elected, of course, because that's what's stipulated in their charter. 
And um, the quota for this one was um, 2,182. Um, like I said before, using the Droop method, um, it's the number of valid ballots, which you see there, 21,814, divided by the number of seats to be elected plus one. Um, so, uh, and then winners also um, included seven incumbents, two that are new to the council, and you can take a look at their names down there. Um, and you can see on the rounds, you know, who was defeated on each round. Um, and only one was actually elected on the first count, um, and it took all the way to 13 to get um, everyone elected. All right, let's look at the school committee. Um, I've actually pictured here um, the first round and the last round because I thought this was an interesting um, way it all shook out. Um, they had nine candidates and some write-ins. Um, six were elected, 20,017 um, valid ballots with a quota of 2,860. Um, so, all the winners were actually determined within nine rounds. But I thought the interesting part of that is the first four were elected in the very first round. Um, they all met or exceeded the quota. And then the last two were elected in the ninth round. So the round by round was, was um, necessary to get to the um, final number of six elected candidates. All right, moving on to East Hampton, Massachusetts. This might seem like sort of a funny place to put it because they're actually only using single winner RCV right now, but there is some consideration for the potential of the use of PR for multi-seat races um, like their school committees and at-large city councilors. Um, but we're gonna talk a little bit about what they're actually doing right now. Um, in 2019, the voters approved RCV elections for single winners, um, the mayor and the district city councilor seats. Um, they are done in districts. I believe there's five districts. And then in November 21, this past election is when they used it for the first time. Um, over here on the right, you'll see a sample ballot. They actually only used RCV in the mayor's race because they had at least two candidates. All of the um, district council races were unopposed, so they did not need to use, obviously, um, ranked choice voting. Um, they do use Dominion um, voting systems, and um, in this case, they had um, three candidates in a pretty substantial write-in campaign um, who received quite a few votes also. Um, Nicola Chappelle was elected in the first round, so I mean, I think that's something we always think about or consider with ranked choice voting. Round by round counts are not always necessary. Sometimes there's a clear winner out of the gate in the first round, and she actually you know, won by 66% of the vote. Um, there were 809 write-in votes, and um, 784 were for Donald Tory, so he ran a, um, a write-in campaign um, alongside the, the other candidates. And as I mentioned before, all of the district city council races were, un were unopposed. Arden, Delaware, um, they're another small town um, that has been using proportional representation for a long time uh, to elect their board of assessors. And um, PR has been used in these elections that are held yearly for since the early 20th century. Um, there's several small towns that were formed around the same time. Interesting story. If you want to look up some um, information about them, we were discussing them earlier today on a team meeting. Um, one of the things I really loved about or I love about this webinar is we get to learn um, a little more about communities who are using ranked choice voting. And I just love the way that Arden, um, you know, put it out there to their voters about what they're doing. And um, I, this is just a little quote from their, um, from their page where the registration committee who actually is in charge of elections said, Arden is not the only one weird place that uses STV. Um, and it talks a little more about where other places are that use STV. Um, I think it's fun to see the different flavors of the communities that are and how they talk with their voters. So Arden Delaware uses the hair quota method. Um, not many people use that anymore, um, but you can see in their city charter, it requires that they do that. Um, so I wanted to add that in. I thought that was an interesting part of this too. Uh, they do hand count their ballots. Um, you know, because they have a smaller population, um, I think that makes it a little more manageable. This could be very cumbersome to hand count ballots um, if you had a large number of voters, just something to point out there. So the 2021 election outcomes, um, eligible voters, there were 338, 
And then they received 206 basically valid envelopes as valid ballots. Um, and they only had a few that were invalid that did not have the appropriate signatures. Um, and 61% participation. I thought that was pretty um, pretty, pretty good, for especially for a municipal election. Um, they have a lot of um, direct governing in Arden, which is um, not seen in a lot of other places anymore. There were 14 candidates who ran for seven seats. Uh, the, the thing that struck me on that is that's actually 4% of the eligible voters ran for this election. I thought, yeah, that's that's really impressive when you when you think about it. People are engaged in their community um, and about 7% of people who actually voted. So. Um, and then here's a little here's their information. This is the summary from the Board of Assessors election results. Uh, they did not provide round by round counts. Um, they were not available on their site. This is actually their official. Um, they share these these election results in a PDF format. Um, you can see they are you know who the winners were um, and who the registration committee is. The registration committee, as I said, it's, it's the Board of Elections essentially who runs elections. Um, and all the folks that helped out with the counting and, and um, being a part of the, this process. So future implementations. I know that um, it, you know, it's been an exciting year for RCV. 100 contests, over 100 contests actually, um, were decided in 2021. We've got a lot of great things coming up in the next year or a couple of years. Um, so we want to share a little bit about what's coming up. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I know we're coming toward the end of our time, um, but some of these upcoming races include both statewide and local elections. We're just going to highlight a few here. Um, you can go to Fairvote's website. We'll, again, we'll include this for you in the webinar materials um, for a much more comprehensive list. And it's, it's a great list. It has some information about um, about what's going on in each location, not just a list. All right, so the big one on everybody's mind, or at least on our mind right now, is Alaska. Um, last year, they passed a um, bill or a, a ballot measure that uh, to, pr to put into place top four nonpartisan primaries, and that's a plurality election. So that's not run under RCV. But then in the general election, when those top four candidates, top four vote getters move on, RCV will be used in the general election in November. Um, in November of 2022, um, they'll have all the state and federal general elections, but in 24, they will also include the presidential election. Um, they are the, the second state to do that. As we know, Maine has already done that. Um, and moving on to Maine, also a statewide um, adoption in 2016 for state and federal primaries in, in the election for Congress. And that's, that's extended, of course, to the presidential um, in 2020. And then the presidential primary elections in 2024 will be added. So that's a new addition for Maine. All right, a few more future um, RCV elections. California, um, just something to know, there's several cities, or there's seven actually cities in California who have ranked choice voting, but they do not have statewide ranked choice voting in California right now. Um, the governor's vetoed it a couple times. Um, so currently only charter cities can amend their charters to use the method now. And I believe there's somewhere around 130 charter cities in California. Um, the ones that recently adopted in 2020, Eureka, Albany, and Palm Desert, um, we'll be using those for the 2022 elections. Um, Eureka will have a mayor and city council elections. Um, they are all single winner. And the interesting thing about Eureka is um, they used to do at-large races for their council, and they had just recently drawn districts um, for their council to try to get better representation, but they... In, they did not consider at this point that I know of um, proportional representation, but they will be using single winner in each of those seats. Um, Albany will use it for city council and board of elections, and it actually is proportional representation. So it's exciting to see that um, implemented in Albany. And then Palm Desert is a little bit different. Um, it was not a ballot initiative. It was passed or it was um, came in, in January of 2020 um, as a part of a California Voting Rights Act sell settlement. Um, the city council will now be elected using one single winner district, and then the remaining seats will run as an at-large election using proportional representation. Um, it's a little um, 
unconventional way to do it, but that's the settlement that came out um, of the action of the lawsuit. So a few more jurisdictions that will continue to use RCV. Um, in California, we still have um, San Francisco, San Leandro, Berkeley, and Oakland, um, Tacoma Park, Benton County, Oregon. Um, all those are continuing their use of RCV. Um, and then one additional new implementation I wanted to point out, um, Georgia recently adopted in 2021, this year, um, to first its first use of RCV in the 2022 runoff elections for military and overseas voters. Um, other states also do this for this purpose. A lot of times what happens, you know, when you have expats living overseas or um, military families that are, you know, their residency is in Georgia and you have these runoff elections, the turnaround time is too quick um, to get, um, you know, two ballots out to them. So they'll use the RCV instant runoff version um, to, to make sure that military and overseas voters, overseas Americans' voices are being heard. So now I'm going to take off my researcher presenter hat and put back on my development hat. Um, you know, one of the big things that maybe people, maybe you do know this or maybe you don't, is we are a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we don't do advocacy. We are neutral and nonpartisan. We're here to help with the administration implementation of ranked choice voting. But what that means is that we we love your support. Um, you know, we, we want to put out the best resources, the most resources we possibly can. And every donation that people like you that that support us makes um, helps us be able to do that even more um, effect, 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 effectively and efficiently. Um, you can certainly go on to um, our website at www.rcvresources.org. There's a little red button down toward the bottom that says donate, or you can just add a backslash donate like you see at the bottom um, and, and shoot a donation our way. We are having our end of year donation drive right now. Um, would love for you to consider an end of year gift. Um, and if you if you can't do a gift and a monetary gift, um, you know, another great way to support us is social media. Follow us, like us, retweet us, share our stuff, comment. Um, definitely, you know, let people know that you are watching what the Ranchers Voting Resource Center is doing. Um, with that, we are going to have a short Q&A. Um, I'm so excited that... Um, that you know, we've got lots of questions in, in the chat and it sounds like we have some interesting things to talk about. Um, so I'm gonna hand it back over to the team um, to talk a little more about um, your questions and things you wanna know more about. Also, don't ever hesitate to re reach out to us. If you don't get your questions answered today, um, feel free to shoot us a message, info at rcresources.org. Um, give us a call, um, our number's listed also. Um, so be sure to um, you know, let us know how we can help you. And I'm I'm gonna turn off the slides because we've all got video on. If that's cool with everybody, works for me. Cool. Okay, who's in charge of the Q and A? <laughs> um, well, I'll start with you know the chat did not disappoint for this Never webinar. Does. Never does. Um, we'll get started with we've got questions in the chat as well as the Q and A only. Um, which, by the way, the Q&A only is a new feature, apparently, with this platform, because yeah. I don't remember that being there before. Um, so we'll just start there. Uh, we have a question in Alaska. Is there a reason for not using RCV in the open primary? Uh, I have not personally heard anything about that. Yeah, well, so there's sort of two answers here. Mm -hmm. One, um, the... So they have, they're using a top four blanket primary, like Kelly said, all mm. candidates from all parties are running at the same time. Four people are getting like elected, nominated out of that, essentially the first round of the, the contest. Mm -hmm. So there's two ways to do that well. The way that they've chosen is to use what is technically a semi-proportional voting method known as the single vote. Every voter only has one vote to cast, even though four people are getting elected. So this actually creates sort of like an interesting, <laughs> I mean, it's a huge experiment in Alaska generally. It's a super interesting test of how the single vote works in a partisan environment where multiple different partisans are running. Um, the limited vote, the single vote 
has been used in to resolve Voting Rights Act cases across the United States, especially in the like in the southeast in Georgia and Alabama and and in Texas. Um, but it's never been used at the state level in the U.S. So this is a really interesting sort of new application of this voting method that should create like it. it there's the potential for it to create like a proportional result where the four candidates are some kind of representation of four different spe- uh, parts of the political spectrum in Alaska. We'll see how that works. Um, they could have used proportional ranked choice voting, which, you know, Kelly's part of the presentation covered. Um, but I don't think that was really ever in the conversation there. This particular model for a primary, a four winner primary or four nominee primary with a ranked choice voting general is an idea that I believe came out of fair vote about a decade ago and it's sort of floating around out there. And then somebody like three years ago just latched onto it and said, let's run this in Alaska. And then it won. Um, when, you know, when it got paired with their, their um, campaign finance and like sunlight transparency law campaign there. Um, so that's like <laughs> the, the academic answer is the first one I gave and the real answer, the like, why is it the way it is, is because this was an idea that existed already for having a top four primary instead of a top two primary, um, but using essentially the same logic as a top two primary uh, with ranked choice voting in the general. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, I'll move right on because we are going to try to keep this to an hour for everybody's benefit. In Ann Arbor and Burlington, where RCV was used and repealed, are there any lessons learned for future implementations to prevent backsliding like this? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Brian. Yeah. Um, So in some of my research on this, one of the biggest things is that people need to focus on the process, not the outcome. Sometimes partisanship, when looking at both these cities, um, kind of got in the way of things. And... uh, people were looking for a particular outcome. And then when they didn't get that outcome, they blamed the system or they tried to attach the system to the person. And so both Ann Arbor and Burlington, when the, the winner of that election, either in Burlington, there was scandal after, you know, a year after the fact, or in Ann Arbor, there was an unexpected winner. Um, people became upset with the outcome. So trying to, you know, reemphasize that this is about the process. We want to make sure we get a majority, um, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. All right. Um, let's see. Are there links to the New Mexico and, and others exit polls available? I need to convince some folks. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, I've i got links to those um, and we'll include them in the Q&A document that we send out after the webinar. Okay. And Chris, you answered this question in the chat, but we can spend a little time uh, fleshing it out. Does Utah law require the use of BPV? Or can cities opt to use the STV instead? Yeah, so there's a slightly more complicated answer, but the short version is if you're electing multiple seats at once uh, in Utah, you have to use block preferential voting. That's the law. That's the only type of ranked choice or of like a ranked ballot method permitted in Utah. There's a slight like nuance here. If you're using ranked choice voting in a primary, um, Because Well, and I I should have mentioned this during my presentation, every city that adopted ranked choice voting in Utah did so to eliminate a primary. So they had a single November general election using ranked choice instead of a primary in August and or in yeah, in August and then a general in November. They just had the November. Um, But if a city wanted to keep their primary and then also adopt ranked choice voting, they can use what's known as bottoms up ranked choice voting. It's um, more representative than block preferential. It's uh, also, it's sort of like the single non-transferable vote, the single vote that I was talking about in Alaska, um, but slightly less proportional than proportional ranked choice voting. So they could use that in their primaries to select their nominees and then use um, whatever form of ranked choice voting is required for the November general, either single winner or block preferential. And that's why I said in my last slide, that there's the potential, there's been some very early discussion of uh, adding more options to the Utah ranked choice voting law uh, so that you are you don't have to use block preferential, but that's right now that's what's required. And if I recall correctly, they're doing some discussion about a cleanup bill that may give us, give the opportunity to to make some of those changes or suggestions at least. Yeah, well, we'll see how that, how that plays out. Yeah. Uh, okay, this is sort of a two-part question. Um, 
does RCV tab or RC tab support STV? And does do we have any indication as to whether or not ESNS will integrate STV into their system? I'll talk about how this has worked generally. So the first question is simple. Yes, RC tab supports proportional mm -hmm. ranked choice voting. It doesn't support the type that's used in Cambridge, the whole ballot transfer. It supports the type that's used in East Point and in Minneapolis, and that will be used in Albany, which is a fractional transfer version of proportional ranked choice voting. And any election administrators in the chat, please don't get too freaked out by these technical terms. It can all be explained. Uh, and I'm keeping things relatively quick, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's used in other uh, cities and countries across the world. So, you know, you can do it even if it sounds a little more complicated. Uh, anyway, RCTAB does support proportional RCV and um, ESNS. Uh, I don't, we haven't heard any plans from them to okay. in actually incorporate it into their system, but they have been, we've worked with them on some of these ranked choice voting implementations in East Point. You know, that we we collaborated with them on getting the tabulator on getting RC tabs sort of running in parallel with their system. Same thing in Portland, Maine, which used the tabulator this year. Um, and they also and and in Utah, um, you know, we were coordinating with them, communicating with them to make sure everything was lining up effectively and making sure, you know, all the voting systems were used securely, properly. Um, through the course of the election, uh, but they we've not heard any plans for them to fully integrate it into their system. Though I I mean, yeah, I think that would overall be good. But I am sometimes hesitant about giving things over to the vendors because they'll start charging money for it, and we can't control that. But that might be the best way to move the voting system mm -hmm. market forward for ranked choice voting. That's all the questions that I can find in the chat and, and the Q&A section. Um, I am scrolling through the initial chat storm that happened at the beginning of the webinar. Rosemary. Um, uh -huh, go ahead. There's one from Kyle. Um, are, are there updated resources covering the cost of RCV implementation in the locales discussed? There are not currently. There should be. Um, there, and that is something that we've talked about quite a bit internally and with election administrators that we've talked to recently. Um, certainly it's a good idea to, to project that out. The caveat to that is, you know, we're not privy to the cost of voting equipment per se, and that can kind of, uh, deviate depending on the size of the jurisdiction and what the jurisdiction may be changing to, or what they already have, that kind of thing. So it would be very hard to pin down an exact implementation cost, but certainly that is a, a best practice that we probably do need to finally put down on paper. We've done a few um, as jurisdictions have specifically requested. Uh, we've recently worked with um, representative from the Secretary of State's office in Nevada who's working on fiscal notes, and we've done some other contacts like that. but. Currently, the the short answer is no, and the better answer is there should be. And you certainly, you know, can contact us on an individual basis, mm -hmm. and we're happy to, you know, meet with you, talk with you, walk you through um, from our end and our perspective um, to to fill in the gaps and help you help you figure that out. Yeah, there's one thing I have figured out since being here is for every jurisdiction that conducts an election, there are that many ways to do it. And that's where it gets really hard to sort of make a universal statement about what something would cost. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I see one uh, thing from Steve in the chat from Steve Chesson about Dominion and their ranked choice voting software. All I, I just like sharing this information. I think it's really valuable for people to have. Mm -hmm. Every time Dominion has provided a quote for their ranked choice voting tabulation software, which we discussed, uh, in and was used in Utah and where else this year? I can't remember. Um, at least one other jurisdiction. Oh, in the New Mexico jurisdictions. Um, they have always quoted a $350,000 $350, upfront fee to get ranked choice voting, uh, like the, their whole ranked choice voting suite um, with their equipment and then a... Um, $70,000 licensing fee thereafter. That's always been their first offer from what I've heard from folks in Alaska and California, New Mexico. 
Um, the ultimate price that jurisdictions have paid has varied a lot. East Hampton, Massachusetts, which also used Dominion. Well, I don't I don't think they got that three hundred fifty thousand dollar quote, but they pay. Um, I believe they pay much less. I don't know the exact number, but I believe they pay much less for that same equipment, same software than San Francisco and Alameda County, which is where Berkeley, Oakland and San Leandro are located. New Mexico, the state actually pays uh, for ranked choice voting software, even though it's only used by their counties. They cover all the costs and they, they also have a much lower fee. They pay a smaller licensing fee for uh, ranked choice voting. I believe it's $30,000 a year, but I don't know exact. I don't know the exact number for that same reason. Rosemary said sometimes these costs are opaque or hard to come by. Um, but the opening bid from Dominion is always quite high, and I've seen jurisdictions manage to negotiate it lower. Um, we are at exactly an hour now um, and don't see any other questions. If anybody on the team does see some, please, please jump in. And if you have any questions that you don't think of right now or whatever, please feel free to contact us at info at rcbresources.org. And we thank everyone for their time and attention. And we appreciate the fact that I feel like we've had a, a pretty successful webinar. So good job, guys. Mm -hmm. And we will see everyone next time. Great. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.